Taylor, when you were a kid, what was your dream job? <laughs> That's a really good question. At one point, I wanted to be a journalist. There's no question about that. Oh, really? Yep. I, uh, I did a project in like grade five where I did a magazine as the project. And five or six years ago, my parents found it in storage. Oh my gosh. And it's like a whole, it's like a 20 page fake magazine. What was it about? <laughs> um, the environment. There was like a picture of the earth on the front of it. Oh, what a, what a <laughs> yeah. forward thinking little tailor. <laughs> I know. And then somehow I got jaded and diverted away from that. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be a paleontologist. My poor parents, the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum, was my absolute favorite place. I always begged them to take me there, and I was obsessed with dinosaurs, and I wanted to find a dinosaur bone in the ground. That was my absolute, absolute top dream. And how did you get diverted from that? Math and science, not my strong points. <laughs> so... Journalism. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> there are so many jobs today that didn't exist when we were little. Lego did a survey in 2019 where they asked 3,000 kids, age 9 to 12, what they wanted to be when they grow up. And for context, the survey was part of an initiative to get kids excited about space exploration. So I was expecting to see astronauts somewhere near the top of that list. Mm. I was wrong. Guess what the top career aspiration for North American kids was? I don't have to guess. I know. Influencer. Yeah, close. YouTuber. YouTuber. 23% <laughs> said YouTuber, and only 11% said astronaut, which means being popular on YouTube is more exciting to kids than outer space. Mm. What does that tell us about the trajectory of the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, today on the show, we'll be looking at exactly that. YouTube, why kids love it, and how the platform affects the behavior of the kids who use it. I'm Taylor Owen, an academic who studies technology and always likes a good gadget review video. I'm Nicole Edwards, a journalist who loves a good handbag unboxing video. This is Screen Time. There are huge questions playing out right now over the place of technology in our lives. Facebook was scheming to bring even younger users into their field. You're basically giving out your personal ID to games so they can make money for it. There are some people that I would like to block in real life. We could work together, but I will add that there are tensions because in the app market, their job is to sell, sell, sell. There's a lot that like, I just don't understand. This is their platform, this is their life. Where's the limit? Every parent is struggling with these questions. Governments around the world are trying to keep up and the scale and pace of change is only increasing. In this show, we'll talk to parents and kids about how they navigate the digital world. And to researchers and policymakers who can help us understand the consequences. You're about to hear from Brenda. She has a nine-year-old named Brody and he's been asking to make his own YouTube channel since he was six. <laughs> He wants to be a YouTuber for life, like he wants that to be his career. So we've kind of explained to him like, there's people that are getting rich off YouTube because they're making amazing videos or shocking videos. But there's also, you know, a million people out there who aren't rich and they spend all their time and money and effort putting all this stuff together and it, it's not getting anything for them. So we encourage him to, you know, have a fallback career. <laughs> Brenda is very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. And she's open to letting Brody have a channel eventually. The plan is to wait until he's 13, which is the age that kids are legally allowed to start using most social media, YouTube included. And Brody wants to be a famous gamer. His plan is to start a channel about Minecraft. Taylor, have you ever watched gamers on YouTube? Not really, no. I have to say, like, I was never sort of a big gamer. I'm not personally a big gamer. And really my introduction to it is through my own son. And so I've sort of come to appreciate it and to value it through his eyes. Yeah, I, like you, have not watched much myself, but I do know that most of them have a signature intro mm. and they often deliver it in this kind of strange, high-pitched, <laughs> super fast way. 
Guys, welcome back to another one of mine and SB's stupid ideas. What's up, everybody? And guess what? In today's video, I'm going to troll the entire Dream SMP with Skeppy. Have you ever practiced your host voice? I got it right now in the back of my head. Oh my gosh, let's hear it. Okay, you're about to hear this. Please don't touch this. Hello, everybody! Welcome back to another YouTube video. Produces T, the best gamer in the world, Total Entertainment, blah, 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 blah. We are going to be playing on Cubecraft, and we're going to play another game on Sky Wars, which I'm probably going to fail miserably this time. Brenda says Brody practices his YouTube voice all the time, and he's also always talking about ideas for his channel, so he's really putting the work in, you know? Mm. And these channels, even though they look like someone just sitting in front of a screen, do take a lot of effort. And for some of the bigger YouTubers, the payout is huge. Mm. So I was curious about whether Brody had thought about that part and asked if he knew how YouTubers make money. Yes, by making videos, of course, and getting a lot, a lot, and a lot of subscribers. Then I asked if he knew how YouTube, the company, makes money. Well, I don't think anybody really works there. And it's a pretty reasonable thought, right? Like, you could see how he'd draw that conclusion, because kids can't put a face to the YouTube platform the same way they can put a face to a YouTube channel. But there's obviously a huge system that revolves around keeping the attention of kids like Brody, and that's not really clear to kids. Absolutely. Brenda and I talked about marketing and platform design, and this is the question that she has for us. Kids YouTube is building that following from babyhood. Why do they have to market to little kids when you know that just them using your product is locking in a customer for life who you're gonna market to for the rest of their, their lives going forward, basically? So I think that that's kind of like a, a morality thing, maybe. You know, like, why do they have to do that? And I think on top of the why questions that Brenda's posing, I'm also really curious to hear about the how. Like how YouTube thinks about marketing to kids versus marketing to adults, how we arrived at those rules in the first place, and how it keeps eyes on its platform, both through ads and through other means. Absolutely, that is their business. Their business is to keep people's attention on their products so that ads can be targeted at them. And the sooner they can get people in the pipeline of that both data collection and profiling, but also connected to these products in a meaningful way, the more valuable that individual user is to the company. And we can debate whether that's a good or bad thing if they should be allowed to do it, but it's clear that is the model. And so that's what our kids and us who use it as well are participating in when we use these products. Like Brenda, there are others out there who are wondering whether it's even moral to be targeting young people with ads on YouTube. So I spoke to Josh Golan. He's the executive director of the nonprofit Fair Play for Kids. They advocate for what they call a commercial free childhood. Their goal is to get rid of marketing to kids altogether. And lately, a lot of their work is focusing on protecting kids' privacy and their data. And in 2019, Fairplay helped bring a landmark lawsuit to stop the collection of kids' data against Google, which owns YouTube. The commercial pressures on children these days are really shaping their development, their values, their behaviors in ways that are concerning. And so what we advocate for is for, you know, not for kids to be tech free, not for kids to be screen free, but for kids to be exempted from this business model, which is so much built around engagement and data collection, and I believe is really damaging to child development. Pick apart a bit that commercial incentive and model for me. So what are the ways that that commercial imperative shapes the way a child consumes and what they consume in YouTube. Unlike with television to a certain degree, right, where you might have been going to watch a program or going to watch two or three programs, that you are going on YouTube, not to watch something in specific, but to go on YouTube and to just watch whatever you choose out of the limited number of options that they're presenting to you at any given moment. And I think that that conflicts with child development in a number of ways. First of all, kids benefit from a clear 
beginning and end. I'm not at all a big defender of Nickelodeon or, or the <laughs> offerings on children's television for kids. Um, yeah. But there is something nice about the shape of it. There's a half an hour show and you have an opportunity to break away after that half an hour is over. But it's not the same as with YouTube where it really feels that it's just never ending. And so I think that's concerning, right? And then when we think about the battles that parents have with kids about getting off of YouTube, I think it's much easier to get a kid off of television than it is off YouTube because it doesn't have that never ending feel. Then you have the recommendations. The recommendations are based on primarily what is the video that is most likely to keep a kid watching, not what is the video that's most likely to be educational or even like entertaining in a way that parents might be comfortable with, but just what's going to keep them watching. If you are a kid and you indicate that you like unboxing videos or you like videos about trucks, you get nothing but videos about trucks, right? And mm. it's just R relentless, right? Like <laughs> yeah, it literally endless, right? Yeah, and I think yeah, if yeah. we were thinking about building a children's video platform from scratch that had children's best interests in mind, like they don't need infinite choices. You know, the whole business model of YouTube, it's volume, right? It's like, we're going to give you literally billions of videos on our site, and we want you to just keep watching video after video after video. And children don't need that. They need videos that have been curated, that have been vetted. It seems like some of the problems Josh points out, especially the curation issue, have been remedied by the creation of YouTube Kids. That's the version of YouTube for kids 12 and under, and it's a totally separate app. It only has kids content, and it has control settings built in so parents can fine tune their kids' experience. So there is a version of YouTube that's been made with kids in mind. There is, but the issue with YouTube Kids is that if a creator doesn't label a video as kids' content, the video won't make it into the kids' platform. I've had this experience with Wally, my son, directly. He loves to watch origami videos, but because most origami creators don't label their content as kids, it doesn't really end up on YouTube Kids in the same way a Peppa Pig video might. So he can never find it in that app. So if he's gonna watch origami videos, I have to let him watch it on adult YouTube, which then exposes him to all of adult YouTube's content. Josh says that this issue of aging out of YouTube kids before someone turns 13 is really common. I think it's different by developmental stages, like for preschool kids, probably having almost an entirely curated video platform is probably fine, right? There's very few origami videos that are going to be at their level of understanding anyway. And I think that that is where YouTube has failed the most is in that sort of middle childhood era range where kids are starting to get more of their own interests and they may not want to be locked into what's considered the cartoons and the traditional, like this is what kids like. But if that means exposing them to adult YouTube and all of the things that comes with it, that's a terrible choice for parents. Like, do we keep our kids completely limited or do we open them up to the big bad world of YouTube? And, you know, Google itself will tell you this, that kids age out of YouTube kids when they get to be like six or seven. They see it as a babyish platform that they don't want to be on. Is that itself a design decision that kids age out? When I look at how YouTube kids is designed, it feels like a platform that was created so that Google could say, OK, we're doing our part for kids. We've created a safe space. Now it's your fault, parents, if you're not using it. What changes when you move into YouTube proper? Let's maybe start with ads. How do ads on YouTube function differently than ads in commercial TV, which we've regulated for decades? How is the ad market in YouTube, particularly as how it relates to children, different? The biggest difference is that everything is data-driven on YouTube as opposed to on television. On YouTube, and this is the brilliance and the troubling part of YouTube, we are going to see completely different things. I'm going to see an ad based on my interests and every website I've ever visited and every video I've watched on YouTube and everything I've liked and, you know, data mining my comments and all those things are going to be combed through and data mined in order to deliver me the ad that I am most likely to be 
responsive to. And so you're essentially on television, you're broadcasting, and on YouTube, you're narrow casting your ad, essentially to an audience of one. But then you, when you combine that with the advertiser has all of this incredible knowledge about the kid that they can use in order to manipulate them. And from a YouTube standpoint, they make more money on these data-driven ads than they do on what's called contextual ads, where you know a contextual ad is very much like the television model. So that's why I say they would rather have kids on the main YouTube platform. So let me see if I get this. Behavioral ads are the kind that we see based on our internet activity. YouTube knows what to show me based on data they collect from my browser and from apps about what I like but you can't legally collect that info from kids under 13. Right. So to stay out of trouble, YouTube makes a rule that says no one under 13 is allowed on YouTube. But content creators can still make videos aimed at kids under 13, and advertisers can still market to them through those videos. Yep. (laughs) So parents are the last line of defense for kids in this situation then, because... YouTube is in the clear. They technically aren't knowingly collecting data from kids, and they're not technically marketing to them either since they don't exist on the platform. You nailed it. But the problem is pretty clear here, which is that kids under 13 are still clearly on YouTube. (laughs) Right. So it's still very possible for YouTube and Google to collect kids' data and show kids ads. It was like the world's worst kept secret. And Google would say, if you ask them about it, they would say, Well, our terms of service say we're for 13 and up, and therefore we're fine. And it was just, how could everybody in the world know that kids are spending so much time on YouTube except the company that knows everything about all of us? In 2018, when Fairplay and others filed their complaint against YouTube with the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S., they said YouTube and Google collecting kids' data without parental consent violates a law called COPA, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. COPA says you can't collect cookies from anyone under 13 without parental consent. Here are two FTC officials from that time, Joe Simons and Andrew Smith, at a press conference announcing the settlement terms. I am pleased to announce that Google and YouTube have agreed to pay $170 million dollars and to implement strong conduct relief in settlement of an action brought by the FTC and the New York State Attorney General's Office for alleged violations of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, commonly known as COPPA. The order prevents YouTube and Google from turning a blind eye to the existence of kids' content on the YouTube platform. This is an historic penalty more than three times larger than the largest privacy penalty ever imposed on Google in any country by any regulator. This action is changing YouTube's business model. YouTube cannot bury its head in the sand. YouTube cannot pretend that it's not aware of the content on its platform and hope to escape liability for COMPA. So problem solved? Sort of. Kids are now a little more protected. And that goes for kids in Canada and around the world, because anyone who uploads to YouTube is ultimately subject to COPA, no matter where they are. YouTube now isn't allowed to show those super specific behavioral ads in any kid's video. And content creators are supposed to label their videos as kids' content. That way, YouTube just can't operate as if no one on their platform is making content for younger users. But for Wally watching Origami videos or Brody watching gamers, their information can still be collected, since that content isn't labeled as being for kids. So the issue hasn't really gone away. I asked Josh what he'd like to see happen next. I think, you know, from a solution standpoint and from a policy standpoint, you need to disrupt the data collection right? Because everything runs on the data and you need to prohibit using data for advertising purposes and you need to prohibit using data for maximizing engagement. Because ultimately it's your responsibility as a company to get parental consent. And once you get that consent, you can do anything you want with a child's data. And what we should be moving to is prohibiting harmful uses of data. And to me, 
using data for advertising is clearly a harmful use of data, but using ab- data to maximize engagement is also a harmful use of data. And so that's where I think from a policy perspective, that's where we need to move. What does Josh mean by disrupting the collection of data used to maximize engagement? He means platforms need to stop collecting kids' data and using it to determine things like which videos they're most likely to click on. Data are used to determine what we see in the recommendation section of YouTube or in the autoplay queue. I think it's worth mentioning something an 11-year-old in Toronto named Mika said to me about what happens when he's watching videos. What should grown-ups know about YouTube? That, first of all, a kid totally loses track of time when they're watching a YouTube video, if it's long. Has that happened to you? Yes. Yes, definitely. What's that like? It's kind of like one second or two minutes into the video, and then a couple seconds later, it feels like you heard, like, five sentences, and you're, like, 25 minutes into the video. Yeah. I've had something similar to what Mika is describing happen to me, where I sit down to watch something specific, and then a few videos later, I snap out of it and realize I'm still on YouTube, and I'm sometimes not even watching content that's remotely related to what I first sat down to watch. Maybe hours later. Yeah. (laughs) Some people call that a rabbit hole. The videos YouTube shows you when you're descending into one of those are all recommended based on the data they've collected about you. You often hear about rabbit holes in relation to YouTube radicalization, especially in gaming communities on YouTube, where videos that people watch will slowly bring them into contact with content that's gradually more extreme, things like far-right content or COVID conspiracy theories. Even adults sometimes don't know when YouTube is taking them for a ride. Do we know anything about how this affects kids' behavior? For this, I think we should hear from Becca Lewis. She's a PhD candidate at Stanford who researches online video platforms and digital subcultures. So we just wanted to talk to somebody who knows YouTube better than we do. And your name came top of list for me of like someone who just can talk about some of like the behavioral changes that are potentially stemming from kids growing up in this medium. Awesome. So I guess like first there's a phenomena that comes up a lot with parents and kids, which is kids just losing time on YouTube and having no sense of time. Like rabbit holes, but not necessarily rabbit holes in the radicalization sense, but more just in the like descending into a vortex in this technology and losing sense of reality in the world around them. Is that a real phenomena? And how would you sort of describe what's going on there? You know, parents had the same concerns around videotapes and television and all of these kind of entertainment vehicles. They're trying to capture your kids' attentions and YouTube is just kind of the newest iteration of this. On the other hand, we do know that YouTube's business goal is to keep people on the platform as long as possible. And so the interesting thing about the recommendation algorithm is that it's really, really difficult to know anything about it from the outside. There's been a lot of hypotheses that perhaps the YouTube algorithm is trying to maybe, you know, keep you glued to the platform by constantly recommending things that are a little bit more extreme or a little bit more intense bit by bit. It's unclear the extent to which that's actually happening. There's a lot of debate right now kind of within the academic community about the extent to which that happens. And YouTube has changed its algorithm over time. So it's kind of an open question as to whether it actually does draw people into radicalizing rabbit holes or otherwise. And partly for that reason, I actually, my stance has been that we pay a little bit too much attention to the algorithm at the expense of other things, partly just from a practical standpoint, because we don't have the resources to research it from the outside in a way that I find satisfying, but also because there are easy things that we can research and look at. And, you know, in general, I think the most important thing is what the content is itself. And that, you know, a lot of times I think there's understandably worry around kids spending a lot of time on YouTube, but so much of that depends on what type of content they're watching. 
Some kids are watching content that maybe promotes bigoted viewpoints or bullying or harassment or any number of things that are worrying. And then a lot of content is incredibly harmless. It may just be pure entertainment. And in some cases, it can actually be genuinely, you know, educational or can involve kind of the critical thinking skills and engagement from the audience. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an important point. But that being said, you do hear a lot of concerns around, particularly in the, the game streaming community, around that community having almost a politics and an ideology. Is that fair to say? And how would you characterize that perspective coming from the young male gaming community? Yeah, I think that that is one of the more interesting and challenging things that I actually have looked at a bit is how politics really does seep into these spaces on YouTube and on other streaming services like Twitch, where the people making it don't consider themselves political. So, you know, a lot of that happens with video game streamers where they're not actually presenting content that is, you know, here's why you should vote for this particular candidate or even here's why this particular ideology is something you should ascribe to. But there's still kind of political undertone to the things they talk about. For example, there's been a long-standing tradition kind of among certain gaming streamers of making fun of people that they consider what they call social justice warriors, which is like outspoken feminists and sometimes queer people and people from other vulnerable communities. And now that's fallen a little out of favor, but they're still, you know, instead of talking about so-called SJWs, they may talk about woke scolds, which is essentially the same thing. And that happens essentially in any um, gaming communities where it is run by, or, you know, the most influential figures are these kind of young white male streamers who don't fully understand kind of the power that they have to shape their audience's thoughts. And then when there's very little oversight or when the oversight is kind of murky or unclear coming from the platforms, then you get these spaces where, yeah, political ideas and cultural ideas do become really prominent. I mean, how do you even approach that as a problem over hundreds of hours talking about subtle political nudges in certain directions with certain ideological influence? It seems like a very difficult one to try and push back against. I mean, particularly as a, a parent, how do you even monitor for that? It is super tricky. And I think it's really difficult to kind of name what that problem is. And I think yeah. part of the challenge <laughs> is that it's- I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, part of the challenge is I think there's this breakdown of categories. Like we used to have news and then entertainment. And even when news was kind of like, you know, commercialized and, you know, in some ways kind of entertainment driven, you still had these like very kind of concrete genres. And I think with streaming, that just completely breaks down because you have people playing video games for their audience, talking about their own personal lives and problems, commentating on the news, you know, kind of yo-yoing back and forth between these things and won't consider themselves news commentators, but are still kind of bringing in that element. I think that a lot of it comes down to understanding the type of content that's being consumed, because I think a lot of it is just that this is a new genre that a lot of parents aren't familiar with. And I think even just kind of learning about who it is that kids are watching and watching some of it, you know, themselves, parents can get a sense of what the, what the nature of the content even is. Another phenomena that you've written a bit about is sort of micro celebrities and the, these influencers that don't necessarily break through in the sort of mass popular way, but are changing behavior of people in many ways who follow them and consume them. And can you describe what you mean by that and whether you think there's some real sort of cultural and behavioral changes that are stemming from this kind of economy? Yeah, um, micro celebrities are so fascinating and definitely a big part of my research. And that's exactly right. It's, you know, this is not Beyonce who can seem perfect and distant and remote. These are influencers who have smaller but super engaged followings. They may broadcast from super intimate spaces in their own homes. They may share really intimate details of their lives. 
and they may interact directly with their audience. You know, this often happens in streaming contexts with live streams that audiences can post comments in real time and the influencer will often read them aloud and respond to them. So you literally have a conversation happening. And in that sense, I think the relationship we see between celebrities and their fans is, if anything, even stronger than in the past. So you get those same dynamics where celebrities who do share their opinions on things, whether it's products and services or other streamers or YouTube itself or politics, any of these things, the audience, I think, is more willing and open to trusting them and their opinion. How do you think that's ultimately changing the behavior of the people consuming it? This problematic feedback loop that can happen as celebrities and their audiences end up inching each other to more and more extremist views over time. I think it's important to note that it's not just the celebrities kind of influencing the fans, but that that certainly is one element of it. The incentives are there and literally they're getting asked to produce it, you know, and they'll say, you know, you, you guys have been, you know, telling me for months now to make this type of video, so I'm finally gonna do it. That Fine, sort of thing. Fine, I'll be right? anti-vax. Fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't wanna be, but I will. Yeah. More and more stories have been coming onto my radar lately that contextualize the reasons that data is the new gold. And it occurs to me that if you're a professional YouTuber with all the competition from other creators and all the time that you're going to have to put into building relationships with your audience, the last thing you're going to want to do is shoot yourself in the foot by taking an instant revenue hit by labeling your video as kids content, because that means that you can't run the most profitable type of ads that you can run on YouTube. So there's really very little incentive there for people to follow that rule. Yeah. And the other thing I marvel at is how little even researchers like Becca who live and breathe this stuff know about how YouTube's algorithm actually works. It just, it never fails to amaze me <laughs> how little we know about what's happening behind the scenes versus how much we use these platforms. You're preaching to the choir here. It's like a, a researcher who tries to understand these systems. Know, it's just I immensely know. frustrating that we don't know more about them or we can't know more about them. And part of the reason is because the data that you need to understand these systems is held by the platforms themselves and very rarely shared with researchers. So you're right, we just don't know. We can understand like Becca does by studying users and studying content and studying communities online, but we don't know exactly what's happening here. The one thing we do know though, and we have a decent understanding of, is the role of money in all of this. There's no question that the business model of these platforms drives some of these harms that we're talking about. I mean, kids are undoubtedly consumers, customers, and products all at once in these platforms. And I think when we're looking at whether and how we allow our kids to engage in these spaces, we have to be sort of clear-eyed about that. Like money is at the center a lot of it. And the other thing we know is just how big the scale of this problem is. I mean, YouTube says like in one quarter last year, they took down 1.8 million videos for breaking their child safety policies. 1.8 million videos in one quarter. Like, so the scale of this is just huge. Yeah. Which to me, as someone sort of watching it from the outside, points to the need for not sort of whack-a-mole policies where we take down individual videos that someone flags as being not kid appropriate or like that kind of solution that user generated solution is never going to solve a problem this big to me and like i really agree with josh golan here that we need better regulations on how kids can be targeted online what data can be collected about them what ads can run to them um, we do that in every other media, and we should do it on the internet as well. I mean, to me, that's just a baseline starting point for this. That makes good sense. And, you know, that, that feels like it's the case with 
so many issues that when it comes to technology, right, what's happening is always kind of two steps ahead of our understanding and our ability to regulate what's happening. And of course, there's no guidebook for parents through all this. And I'm thinking of Brody from the beginning of the episode, because I know the second he turns 13, he's starting his own YouTube channel. Your parent has to know, so you have to be 13, blah, 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 blah. So for parents like Brenda, who have kids that have these types of aspirations. I think it would be 18 if I got my choice. <laughs> I'd love to hear from a tech savvy parent like yourself about <laughs> what types of things you do with your kid when it comes to being safe on YouTube. I mean, YouTube presents a real challenge for me, like, cause I see the immense benefit of some of the content on there for my son. It's kind of, you have to think you have to look at it as a really high, high risk, high reward internet space. So from that perspective, we look at it as a place that needs to be monitored very closely and needs a ton of oversight. So my son, for example, isn't allowed to search on his own on YouTube. He has to tell us what he's gonna put in the search box before ah. he hits search. Autoplay's turned off. We never let him watch it alone. He can't go off and watch YouTube for an hour, which is very different than how we view something like Netflix, where is maybe not be, may not be quite as high reward. There's not like amazing origami maker <laughs> instructional videos on Netflix, but there also isn't radicalizing content that's gonna suck him into a rabbit hole and show him COVID misinformation. <laughs> I think that's ultimately how parents have to engage with these platforms, like look at different tactics for different platforms. And that leads us into what we'll be talking about in the next episode, which is how much parents should monitor their kids and also when they should stop. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Screen Time from TVO, Antica Productions, and the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at McGill University. I produce this show along with our senior producer, Kevin Sexton. Production assistance by Emily Morantz. Research support by Sonia Solomon, Cody Hauka, and Helen Hayes. Mixing and sound design by Phil Wilson. Our executive producer is Laura Regeer. Stuart Cox is the president of Antica. Katie O'Connor is the senior producer of podcasts at TVO. Lori Few is the executive producer for digital at TVO. If you like what you heard, tell a friend. Here goes nothing. <sighs> Shout out to TVO Kids. This video is sponsored by TVO Kids. One of the best things on the internet. You should probably watch it if you're eight years old. But if you're not too bad, so sad. I'm glad. Thank <laughs> you.